Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Christine Sullivan, the chair of this event, and we are so happy that you showed up both in person and on Zoom. We want to thank the East Brunswick Public Library and especially Melissa Hozak for hosting this event and managing the technology. And we are delighted to see that Sorry. EBTV is recording this event so that we will be able to use it again and again. On your seat, you will see your agenda. If you look on the back of this agenda, you will see a QR. This QR will bring you directly into the East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force website. And, and that will be just terrific. You will also see we have a postcard for the Q&A part of the program. When you write your question, just hold it up and uh, my co-chair, Frankie Bush, will be able to collect these and feed them to Nancy Kranich, our, our uh, moderator. We also have a letter. If you, you will have some time to scan the letter and read it. This is a great ask for the, and an awareness from the Environmental Commission. We would ask that if you agree that you would please sign and bring it to the table where our environmental expert is, it will be mailed tomorrow. There is also, if you notice on this letter, 25 names of very important people. You will have an opportunity to go to the table and sign uh, the clipboard and this, this letter will then be sent with your signatures to all 25 of these very important people. It's important to mention that during the question and answer period and during the panel discussion that everyone speak directly into the microphone. If you don't, you just can't be heard. I think they call it eating the mic. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that about a year ago, the East Brunswick chapter of Hadassah put on an expansive program on the environment. When all of the data was uh, collected and analyzed by Dr. Schussel, she found that we have got to do a lot better. And so what we did was form a committee and then we worked with the East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force and Alpha Delta Kappa, the Kappa chapter, to bring this program to you and to move this forward so we can get past plastic one bottle at a time. Uh, and now I would like to turn the program over to Mayor Brad Cohen. Well, thank you, Chris, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I do think that this is a critical time and a critical topic that we all need to be addressing, and this whole idea about the world having become so disposable has actually been the cause of many of our problems that we face today, and I think that this, along with climate change, is truly the existential problem uh, of our time, and our role in life is to try to pass on to the next generation a world that's better than the way we found it. So we really need to start getting our act together to do that because we're not on a course uh, to be able to do that for our children and grandchildren. Before we start today, I do also want to echo what was said um, before in terms of the appreciation for the people that helped got us here, get us here today. The East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force uh, is a group that is an offshoot of the Environmental Commission, and it's charged with doing this exact type of work. From its inception, they were working on reducing uh, single-use plastic bags, farmers markets in town, and all of the type of things that we feel are important from a sustainability standpoint. 
but the role and the objective that they wanted to address this year was this exact issue. And I want to thank the partners they've brought in for this evening. The East Brunswick Public Library has always been on the forefront of supporting these type of programs and have offered this facility today, along with EBTV, in order to try to get that out to the greater public. Of course, the East Brunswick chapter of Hadassah has always been, this has always been a big issue for, for Hadassah. They've done this before we brought them in, and it's something that they have actively participated in. And of course, the uh, Kappa chapter of Alpha Delta Kappa also committed to this type of work. Today, you're going to be listening to and hearing from epidemiologists, a science teacher in the school system here, students, politicians, people who all have some ability stake in this problem and have the ability if we all work together to be able to find solutions and these are complex problems it may sound so simple but it's not uh, we we have to all work together to solve these difficult problems i remember actually a couple of days ago i was just in wawa and i saw some uh, resident in town uh, uh, somebody known for a while a really nice guy carrying about six different items i, I said i don't understand where's your Where's your bag? Oh, the governor made us get rid of plastic bags and now I have to carry all this stuff. Well, you don't really have to carry all this stuff. You could actually have a you know, reusable bag in your car and you wouldn't have that problem. And it kind of whisked me off. But if all of us look back just a couple of years, this was a problem we were addressing. Um, working together, we got to get legislation that actually got that to change. We worked and prepared for it with our businesses and with our communities and with our schools over the course of a year and a half, even in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, I have to tell you, I didn't get one letter in the mayor's office complaining about this switch. It was relatively uneventful and we all adjusted. And I think that's the same could be said for what we're looking to do here today. We need to simply reduce recycle or learn to refuse entirely the uh, single-use water bottles and bottles plastic bottles that we see littering the surface of our communities and that's something that we will be able to work together we need to work with our communities our businesses and most importantly we need to work with our schools because the next generation is what we're teaching right now the this is where we need to start and i don't know I remember when i taught my kids to drive uh, they became mini experts afterwards we all end up kind of listening to what our kids do and 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 they make us feel guilty when we do the wrong thing so i think starting and working uh, with our schools to change behavior is 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 critical so i uh, also intend to um, put out a proclamation from the township emphasizing how important this is to the township and that it's something that we hope we could be a model to other townships to do the right thing. So I'm not going to take any more of anybody's time. I want to give most of it to the people who are here who are the experts. And again, I thank you all for attending tonight. I'm going to turn it back to Chris. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> It is now my pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, if you could just hold your hand up when I call your name so people see you. Dr. Yvette Chosso is an epidemiologist and biostatistician at Rutgers School of Biological and Environmental Science. She has a great PowerPoint that she's gonna share with us today. Next is Dr. Nicole Farenfeld, she is the associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Rutgers School of Engineering. She has done research on New what is happening to New Jersey waters with what we're putting in into it. And that will be really interesting to hear. Melissa Novak is an inspiring teacher with 15 years in the East Brunswick school system. She uh, is now going to be the eighth grade science teacher at Churchill Junior High. While at Hammerschel, she spearheaded a school-wide poster contest. Now what the kids had to do was they had to illustrate a picture of what the crisis is, and then they had to think of one way to solve it. So I hope tonight you will be able to go back to the whiteboard and take a look 
That's a terrific work the, these kids have done, and we will applaud the winners later. Next is Eliza King. Eliza was in uh, Ms. Uh, Novak's class, and she represents the next generation already involved in environmental issues and learning so much. Next, uh, we have Nancy Pinkin, our government official. Nancy is a former assemblywoman who served as chair of the assembly. She did uh, in uh, environmental and solid waste committee. She headed that. Uh, she was on the assembly of health and senior services committee and she served uh, on the assembly for law and public safety on that, co that committee. Through Nancy's leadership, a number of very important initiatives were passed which really improved our community. And our moderator is Nancy Kranich. Nancy teaches at the Rutgers University School of Communications and Information. She conducts special projects for the Rutgers University libraries, and she is a very fine professional with much experience in, in being a moderator for many public forums. And with that, I hand it over to you, Nancy. Thanks so much, Chris, and thank you, Mayor Cohn. Wow, I'm thrilled to be among you, and so pleased that East Brunswick is not only here at the library to have this discussion, but that you are really stepping forward on these issues, so it gives me some hope. So um, I'm delighted to join you tonight for what promises to be a really uh, thought-provoking conversation with your neighbors. Hopefully you'll get to know each other better. Um, who've come to talk about dealing with this particular issue of bottle, uh, plastic bottle recycling. So the conversation is going to offer everyone on the panel and those of you participating on Zoom an opportunity to listen to experts and frame the problem of uh, plastic bottle recycling. And I think you'll learn a lot from our presenters and the people reacting to the presentations. We're going to hear from hopefully you in the community um, and uh, hear about how you're working on the problem and how you want to work on the problem. And then we can reflect for, uh, with others about how this community in particular can take action to deal with this particular issue and hopefully consider ways that we can move forward together. And this whole idea of local communities addressing these issues, I think, is something that's so critical. And East Brunswick, uh, thank you for taking leadership in this arena. So a few words about the conversation. Um, people on the panel and on Zoom are here to listen and to learn, so uh, we'll all be learning from each other. And our goal is to understand how people who reside in this community see local issues around plastic bottle recycling. Now, we're not promising any specific outcomes from this conversation, but Hadassah, the East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force, and other partners are eager to share what is learned uh, tonight and how to use it to move forward. So hopefully we have lots of people taking notes that we will gather your thoughts as well as the thoughts of some of the people up here on the panel to put together to think about how we move forum, uh, forward. Sorry. So at the end, we will announce the winner of our middle school uh, poster contest. And those po uh, posters, as Chris said, will be on display on the whiteboard uh, in the back of the room. We're going to have this letter writing uh, call to action. You all have the letter, so hopefully you'll sign it. And uh, we have a, a table in the back ready for you to take your letters. Um, there's books and environmentally friendly products of interest on display, and there is a door prize, so you have to stay to see who wins the door prize. You should have all gotten raffle tickets when you came in. So just a few ground world rules to remember. Um, we want everyone to participate and listen to one another. Keep an open mind. Um, help ensure that people are respectful. Um, it's a respectable a respectful place for all of us. Um, we want to maintain an atmosphere for discussion. 
And it's okay to disagree, but not to be disagreeable. So is everybody okay with these rules? Yes, yeah. okay, very good, thanks. So I am just going to keep the conversation going. I will tell you, I don't even live in East Brunswick, but I feel like I'm an honorary member of your community. But I live in a nearby community, and hopefully uh, we will get our community to, do, uh, to follow your lead on this. So let's get started. Um, we're going to begin with our two presenters, our experts, who are going to talk about the problem, and then we will have our panel respond. Uh, keep in mind that you have five by seven cards at your seat. Uh, if you have questions, fill out your card and pass the cards to uh, the aisle, either the middle aisle for that group or the aisle. Um, nearest the door for this group and we will be picking them up and have a chance later for your questions and that's also for those of you on zoom we also hope that you will uh, share with us your questions or ideas about how you see moving forward so Yvette your your opportunity okay thank you very much thank you everyone for coming today I'm going to talk about uh, getting past plastics one uh, bottle at a time. What we're here today really is to discuss what we can all do as citizens to, um, to promote this, to promote reducing our consumption of single-use plastic bottles. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the community can do, what New Jersey can do, and um, what the U.S. is doing and what the rest of the world is doing. But I don't have much time, so I'm just really going to give a very brief overview. Okay. Um, we need to identify the ways we can cut back plastic bottle use by the community. It seems like a big problem, but I'm going to let you know, you know that it's something that we could all you know, cut into, this big problem, really chipping away at it. And by doing that, we, we um, create like a, um, a revolution really in our plastic bottle use. We have to understand our current behavior and that way we can make changes. Um, as Chris mentioned, we did a survey in uh, East Brunswick and Highland Park back in the fall to see uh, people's recycling behavior. Hadassah, a women's uh, health organization, did this. And when I analyzed the results of this survey, we found that people thought that they were um, really recycling enough. They, were, they thought that they had done everything possible, but you know, as, as we will find out, they really could do more. Um, as I said, few recycling surveys are done, and New Jersey towns um, do fee-based recycling. That means we have curbside recycling instead of um, other recycling types of programs that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, again, this was um, what I just mentioned. The state is doing a lot by recently um, having the plastic bag uh, ban. Okay, so that's like a first step, and we're going to talk about what other steps we can take. And tackling plastic bottles is our you know, um, aim, our next step. Um, if you grew up in the 60s, you know, you never really came across plastics very much. They really weren't in the environment. And the first place that I recall even hearing them talked about with great emphasis was in this movie, The Graduate, where an uh, older man comes to Dustin Hoffman, sort of a young graduate, and says, I have one word for you, and that's plastics. And that sort of became like the rallying cry, I think, for the plastics industry to inundate us with plastics of all forms in the 70s and 80s and beyond. Also in the 60s, this um, book by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, uh, made us aware of the dangers of pesticides in our environment. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is that we need a modern day plastic planet wake-up call, um, and a movement to alert a large audience about the environmental and human dangers of indiscriminate use of plastics. Okay, so is it profitable to recycle plastics? So, you know, in New Jersey, we don't recycle plastics for money because we don't have a bottle bill, and I'll mention what that is. Um, New Jersey's never passed a bottle bill. 
Um, but there are 10 states in the United States that do have a bottle bill, which just means that you can, um, you pay a, a deposit fee when you buy a, a plastic bottle, and you can recoup this fee by returning those plastic bottles. Uh, states without uh, bottle bills have curbside recycling and sometimes recycling centers where they can, um, where you can drop off your recycled clean plastic bottles and other recyclables. But these don't pay you. Okay, so New York is the closest of the 10 states in the country that have a bottle bill, but the reward is only five cents a bottle. So it's not really that profitable to go all the way to New York to recycle your bottles. Um, and these are the other states with the uh, recycling bills. Um, and, and this really just requires distributors and retailers to collect this minimum refundable deposit, which they then give back when, um, when you return the bottle. The issue is that they're very successful, these um, states with the bottle bills. Uh, they, in, in New York, they've, you know, um, collected, they've, they've kept plastic bottles out of the environment. You don't see in the states with bottle bills, you don't see as much plastic pollution on the roadsides as you do in New Jersey and other states. And, um, you know, double the amount of plastic is recycled in those states because people do bring it back. So it makes everyone a little more responsible uh, having a bottle bill. Um, and. You know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of opposition in New Jersey to the bottle bill. Um, people say it would uh, duplicate curbside recycling. There, it's a public health threat. Um, it's inefficient, outdated. It's a regressive tax. It will damage local businesses and on and on. There's always a lot of opposition to changing the law. So, um, so we have a ways to go with that, but that's one future um, kind of step that we could take. In East Brunswick, the recycling department has expanded the definition of reduce, reuse, uh, recycle, right? They have what's known as the six R's, where um, one is to refuse products that are destined for the trash after the first use, to repair items in your home when possible, not just toss them, and to return nutrients to the soil by composting, and that's the three new R's that are added to reduce, reuse, recycle. Again, more extensive recycling initiatives. For those of you who don't know, you know, we, we do have the curbside recycling program, but not all uh, plastics are recyclable, right? In East Brunswick, we only recycle the number one and two plastics. And if you're wondering what those are, they're the polyethylene terephthalate, that's the plastic water bottles, and high density polyethylene. Everything else is not recyclable here. And um, while some materials you can take to the recycling center for recycling, um, you know, there's a problem because a lot of plastics are not recyclable. And so what do you do with them? You know, numbers three, two, seven. There's a company in Trenton called TerraCycle that will pick up these um, recycling, these unrecyclable plastics, and they recycle them at the manufacturers. Uh, but you do have to send it to them unless you want to take a trip there, and that you know, tends to be expensive. You can buy a box and staples. Again, it's, it's somewhat costly. So the next question would be, well, if, um, you know, so then why do we even have these plastic bottles? Well, in the 60s and 70s, when manufacturers started producing large amounts of them, they tended to convince people that it was healthier to drink water from plastic bottles, that our tap water was contaminated, and um, there were possibly, you know, more contaminants in the tap water, but I'll, I'll get to that in the question and answers if you're interested about that. Um, but recently there was a report that, um, that said that the impact plastics have had on the environment and human health is actually quite negative. 
Um, chemicals added to plastics are absorbed by the body and can alter your hormones and increase inflammation. So this water in the plastic bottles is not really ideal for human consumption. And, um, you know, as we know from everything we're going to mention today, the plastic debris has the potential to injure wildlife, uh, to poison, you know, the groundwater and, and our landfills. So we have to, you know, this really makes the point that plastic bottled water is not really better for you, so why are we still using it when we have alternatives? And the alternatives are these, um, you know, easily available, not that costly water filters, right? You can just filter your own tap water. It comes out tasting much better, almost like spring water. And um, best of all, it's plastic free. It doesn't have the um, harmful chemicals that are added to plastic bottles. And, and so you're making a better choice for yourself and the environment. And the last thing uh, that you can do is to make sure if you actually have to buy a plastic bottle, a plastic water bottle, you recycle it. If you're, you know, try to fill it up at home, take it with you wherever you go, but if you need to buy the plastic bottle, um, recycle it responsibly. If your workplace doesn't have recycling containers, petition them to, to get some. Um, you know, it really, in this day and age, everywhere you go around the world, you see recycling containers, sometimes not only three, but four and, and more. Um, and those are the countries that are really concerned of their, about their environment. So make sure your workplace, your school, your gym, all have these recycling containers. New Jersey is making, you know, inroads into the plastic uh, pollution problem by having the plastic bag ban, right? We know since May 4th, we're not, we're no longer um, able to get plastic, single-use plastic bags from retailers, um, but we have to do more, right? Plastic bags is just like one part of the problem. Um, you know, it leaks into our oceans, it causes this tremendous, tremendous pollution problem that we may not ever be able to clean up. But we need to think about bans, not just for plastic bags, but for plastic bottles. Because where does all this plastic end up? Even as far away as Antarctica, right? So one of the planet's most remote and pristine locations. There are various sized plastics that have been found in Antarctica, you know, microplastics, and they're also in the sea ice, the surface water, the sediments, even in the seabed. Most of the plastic in the world is not recyclable because it's dirty plastic, meaning it's from these, you know, different um, chemicals that, you know, are in those categories of number three, four, five, six, and seven, right? Shampoo bottles and um, laundry detergent bottles and all of those. Yeah, China used to uh, accept these uh, dirty plastics, but since 2017, they no longer do. And it's become, the price of recycling is, is, um, has dropped to the point that it wasn't worth it and many countries just abandoned recycling as a result. So dirty plastic found its way to Indonesia and uh, Vietnam where some of it is used for creating energy because uh, petroleum is su in such um, limited supply or very expensive. People burn plastic bottles in these countries and that creates um, terrible you know, human health hazards. Uh, from the fumes and the particulates of these um, burned plastic bottles. And these bottles come from all over the world. They're, they're shipped illegally to these countries, you know, for burning. Uh, there are some solutions. It's not all bleak. Um, you know, in Israel, a company uh, interestingly called Alchemy is turning the dirty plastics to construction materials to seal uh, surfaces like uh, roofing. 
And, um, but most of the plastic still winds up now in um, microplastics, as I'll show you, or, or we probably passed. It takes a thousand years for plastic bottles to decompose. So until that happens, they break up into smaller and smaller particles. Fish eat these particles, and then we sometimes eat the fish. And so we're consuming now about five grams of small plastic particles a week, according to a recent report. That's like a credit card sized weight of plastic that we're consuming. And as I mentioned, you know, this wreaks havoc on our bodies um, in terms of inflammation. Some of the plastic is carcinogenic. Um, we need to figure out a way to not continue to add to this. All right, so as you know, I think it's clear plastic bottles are this habit we have to kick. All right, we have landfills are overflowing. As we can see from this um, table, uh, since the 60s, we've produced more and more plastics every year, and only less than 10% is recycled. And most of it, the number at the bottom left, is landfilled, right? Which, that me which means it's going into our, um, our groundwater and our oceans. What's being done around the world? Okay, some countries have taken a very aggressive stance um, towards plastics. In Canada last year, they declared plastic a toxic substance and they um, are paving the way for its, you know, eventual ban, um, cer certainly for single-use plastics. In Rwanda, it's the first plastic-free nation um, as of 10 years ago. And um, anyone who's uh, caught with plastic items faces a jail sentence of up to six months. So they even check people at the border. They can't be bringing in plastics. And just recently in India, They've, they're banning all single-use plastics. Uh, so with a population of 1.35 billion people, this is a really big step. And we can all learn from these countries and others that are taking the, you know, this aggressive stance in plastics. So I hope you see that, you know, we can really make a difference as individuals. The companies we work for can, help us, right, help us um, refill our plastic bottles and you can get any kind that you like, our reusable plastic bottles or stainless steel bottles, gyms, schools, they can all have these um, refillable uh, dispensers of water or they can sell in their vending machines instead of plastic bottles, they can sell the refillable bottles. So this was just a timeline that um, we don't have time for, <laughs> but it's really the, you know, the steps that I hope we'll follow to educate the community, to get the resources from the East Brunswick Environmental Commission, to write letters to our legislatures, and to have impact with this plastic bottle reduction. There are some organizations you can join and places that you can get further information. I'm sure you'll have access to the PowerPoint so that you can do this. And um, just want to thank everyone for joining, for being here, for spending time to think about this because it will really um, make a difference for, if not for, our, for us and our uh, environment for our children and our grandchildren. Um, I have some questions that I prepared that people might be interested in, but I'm going to leave them to for later, and maybe we'll come back for them. Thank you, Yvette. And Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Fahrenfeld. I'm on the faculty in civil and environmental engineering at Rutgers. And I thought I'd share with you today some of the research we've done in my lab about um, plastic pollution in the waters in New Jersey. 
Um, and on the screen, I don't do this work alone. There's a lot of students who work on it and my collaborators as well. Um, so we started working on this problem around 2013 where I had a friend working at a drinking water utility and they were getting consumer calls asking what they knew about plastics and their drinking water and I thought, well, <laughs> that seems unlikely because I was thinking it was the personal care products um, and those are very, I think, large enough for most people to see the beads that were being added to those. Um, so we ended up going out into the surface water to look for them instead. So our lab's been working on answering uh, several questions of which I'll only talk about um, one of them today, which is some work we've done out on the, the Raritan and the Hudson Estuary, looking for you know how much plastic is there in these smaller size classes, what type is there, and where is it going. Um, so the, the work here is motivated by an estuary and physicist that we work with, and he basically explained it to me, this is not my expertise, that when you have your fresh water from the river meeting the ocean water, that that's a place that particles accumulate, and that's a great place for entry into the food web, um, where you have particulate matter, sediment, nutrients, that's where a lot of marine life might like to feed. So when we do our sampling, we try to go out and capture some of these what we call frontal zones, where the fresh and the salt water meet and those particles would accumulate, thinking that's probably where we might, our hypothesis, you know, that's where we might see the highest concentration of these. Um, so this is not actually the Raritan Hudson. This is work we did on the Delaware recently, but if you are out in flat conditions, you could train your eye and sort of see where, um, I don't know if the pointer works, but you can sort of see these scum lines out there or bubble lines, and a lot of that's seagrass, but if we're ever going to find like an entire plastic bottle or a whole mylar balloon, we just find tons of them if we trawl back and forth across those. Um, Um, so when we went out on the, the Raritan Hudson, we went out with nets and did some toes to collect what particles might be in the water. Um, we also collected some samples from wastewater treatment plants, what you flush down the toilet before and after it was treated. Um, and also stormwater, what goes down the storm drains, which is quite often very lightly or not treated depending on where you are. Um, and then our collaborator, Dr. Saba, works on zooplankton, so very small marine life. Um, and our goal here is just to see how much plastic is out there and are zooplankton eating it? And if so, how does that vary where we find that? Um, so some examples of like all the particulate matter, all the particles we would find in a water sample you see on the left. And I think folks aren't that bad at picking out the plastics there, the bright blue particles. Um, but we use chemical techniques to confirm them because for clear or black particles, it might be difficult to um, say if they're plastic or not. And then we also are very interested in what type of plastic is it and do you see signs of, of weathering or aging. So on the right, you see kind of like a fingerprint that we get back that tells you something about the chemical structure. So then we could say, hey, that was polypropylene or polyethylene. Um, but just knowing the type of polymer that we observe um, isn't is useful, but it's not necessarily going to tell us where it came from because there's just, um, this is data from Plastics Europe. They make these really beautiful, useful reports just showing you how much crossover there is across industries. You know, it's not like polyethylene is only in your um, shopping bags. People use it for a lot of other things. So it's hard for me to say once it's this small particle where exactly it might have come from. There's just a lot of overlap. Um, so here's um, some pictures of, I'm showing you maps. Um, I wish this pointer would work. But basically where the red dots are, um, the bubbles are showing you the concentration of plastic. So if the concentration's bigger, it's a bigger bubble. So you can see for the red dots, the biggest bubble we see is at the mouth of the Raritan. And if you go out further into the estuary, the bubbles get smaller, so we're finding lower concentrations of plastic. So probably dilution, and that was for the larger size plastics we were looking for. On the right, the gray and black bubbles, those were for a smaller size we were looking for, and there you see a very different story. It's smaller concentrations in the 
exiting the mouth of the Raritan right by Perth Amboy, and you go out kind of more where the Hudson River's coming down and the concentration gets higher. Um, and we like to nerd out on asking questions of like, well, why is this? Is it that the large plastics broke down into smaller ones, or did the little ones come from the Hudson? Um, and try to use different techniques, some modeling, um, some looking at the fingerprints to try to answer those questions. Um, so then the work of looking up and the uptake into zooplankton is really led by Grace Saba's group, and you see her here in the, the foreground of that picture in her bib. Um, so they'll go out and tow as well with us in parallel, um, collect the zooplankton, then very smart students can look at them and separate them by species. Then we'll extract everything from their insides, just dissolve them, and look at them under a slightly different chemical uh, chemical instrumentation here. But it gives you the same kind of output, a fingerprint that we could backtrack to say, hey, that was, that was plastic, and it was probably this type of plastic. Um, so here are some examples. Again, the top shows you bubbles, where the larger bubble is a higher concentration. Um, these are what the zooplankton look like on the lower right, so obviously much bigger than they are in real life. They're about a, a quarter of a or 250 microns, so they're, they're very small. Um, and so different species and concentrations we found, and we're reporting them as like per individual. I can't tell you if all the plastic we found when we extract from 50 or 100 of them, maybe it was in just one of them, maybe it was evenly distributed, right? We don't know because we did it all together. But if you assume it was like evenly distributed, it was like one in three to almost every zooplankton would have some microplastic, we're assuming in its gut. Um, the idea being that these little um, marine biota, Grace probably will not like this explanation, but I'm an engineer, they, they eat these and it would pass through their digestive tract and then it would end up in their, their feces, right, their zoop, the poop. And then that would be a way that they end up settling. So that's a bigger question we're trying to answer. You have these little particles, things eat them. Some folks are interested in the toxicity, entry into the food web. Here we're kind of interested in how that might control their eventual settling and removal from the top of the, the water column, um, if any of that made any sense. <laughs> Hopefully somewhat. And we, we think this is really interesting data. There's been other folks that did lab studies with force feeding and would do things like use fluorescently labeled particles, um, but it's not really environmentally relevant. So we think we have some kind of unique data out here showing like what's actually happening in the, the waterway. So this is a picture from someone else's work where they did kind of that proof of concept. Yes, these, these little creatures will eat these particles. Um, so we'd also compare, you know, what we're seeing in the, the surface water, that's the blue box on the right, it just shows you the box, shows you the range of the data, um, compared to wastewater influent, effluent, and stormwater. So obviously those, I'm not going to call them sources, they're pathways of entry, we're the sources, right? We put things into these systems, um, they're higher. Um, and we've been very interested in looking at stormwater itself. I, I know it's very late in the day to hear a lot of science, so I won't show you that, but I will point out, um, I think I included this, yeah. From other folks looking in the literature, if you compare what goes into a wastewater treatment plant to what leaves it, wastewater treatment plants have gotten a lot of blame, I think a bit perhaps unfairly, because they are actually removing a fair amount of the plastic, um, and a lot of the plastic shouldn't be ending up in there anyway, with folks flushing things and letting things go down the drain that shouldn't. Um, so a lot of it, folks have found, yes, you can absolutely find some plastics in the effluent. How much would depend on what size range you're looking for, where you're looking, what treatment they have, sure. Um, but overall, most of them are having removal. And this is um, on a log scale. So it's like 10 to the fifth down to 10 to the two. That's a lot of removal. <laughs> um, so I don't, I showed you some wastewater treatment data, but I don't want everyone calling up their wastewater treatment plant operator. I want you going to your friend and saying, stop flushing flushable wipes. They're not flushable. Um, so with that being said, just a summary, we have some information. This is some of the information our lab has gotten on just how microplastic is distributed spatially in the estuary and evidence of in situ, meaning like actually in the environment, ingestion by the zooplankton. Um, again, that's mostly, almost all done by Grace, Grace's group. Um, 
So everything I showed you, and we have other ones, are all peer-reviewed scientific literature um, that, are, that are out there. And all the hard work is usually done by the students. So um, in the upper left, Carly Sips was a master's student at Rutgers Camden. Kendi Bailey um, was a master's student at Rutgers. Will Bonney also got his master's at Rutgers. Um, and Raj, I didn't show any of his day to day. Will and Raj were working on some of the stormwater. Um, and this was a big collaboration with Rutgers Camden. Georgia Arbuckle's team is really good at chemistry and they help us out with a lot of this. Grace, I mentioned a few times, does the zooplankton work. Bob Chant does the estuary and physics and tells us this is where you want to sample. Um, and this was funded mostly by New Jersey Sea Grant, so that's mostly my understanding coming from taxpayer dollars, so, so thank you. Thank you. So Melissa. <laughs> Tell us about what the East Brunswick schools are doing about this problem. In, so I can only speak about my experience at Hammersholt Middle School because that's, you know, we have 11 schools and the only one that I've taught in to date is what would be Hammersholt. And as of this time in my classroom, there is a blue recycling bin for paper recycling. Um, in the cafeterias, there are recycling bins um, for the students to use as well as in the hallways. And there are, there is at, in all of Hammersholt, which as of last year had approximately 1,300 students, there is one water bottle refilling station. Um, I will say that since the pandemic, um, water fountains pretty much across the board have been closed. So I do see a huge uptick in the number of students carrying um, reusable water bottles. But the concern for me is that we need more refilling stations to make it, you know, it's, if, for those of you who have never seen Hammersfield Middle School, I like to call it East Brunswick Community College because it's a very large building. And to have students, you know, moving all around the building to refill their bottles in that one location is not really, um, you know, the best idea. If, if we could just have more um, refilling stations, I think that would be a significant way to help this problem within our public schools. And how are your students and their parents responding? So for the past 15 years, I've taught sixth grade science, and we usually end the year with a unit on oceanography, and students get really excited. Oh my gosh, I love whales, I love dolphins, I love the beach, and I'm like, yeah, that's not where we're going with this. Um, at the end of the year, we do spend a, a lot of time talking about human impacts on the environment, and we focus a lot on plastics. Um, a lot of the, I'm really proud of us as a school district because I see a couple of my students in the audience and I think that you guys can follow along with a lot of this college level and for adult learning that was just shared because of the great work that we are doing um, in East Brunswick Public Schools. In my class, we, you know, we talked about how, you know, there's plastics in human blood, you know, babies, feces, right? We're finding plastics. So, um, the students, even though they're initially disappointed that we're not going to learn about whales and dolphins and watch The Little Mermaid, um, they definitely do get hooked by this idea of, oh my gosh, this is a huge problem. There are some simple things that we can do to address the problem and then moving forward, bigger things that they can do. Um, we do at the end of the year. Um, students design, well, they take something that already exists that does create a problem with excessive use of plastic, single-use plastics, and they try to reinvent something that already exists. And, you know, I tell them, there's, the sky's the limit, right? Because if you would have, I, I know there's a lot of you out here with me, if somebody would have told you 25 years ago you'd be carrying a computer around in your pocket, you would have been like, not happening, right? So sky's the limit, 20 years, you never know what we can do. And all of these crazy ideas start, like all of these awesome ideas we have today started with something crazy. Somebody thought they were crazy a long time ago. So the students definitely embrace this idea that they are change makers, that they can take these things that they've learned in STEM class, in social studies, in science, in mathematics, and take all of that, integrate that together to kind of come up with this pipe dream of what we can do to potentially make 
change. And I do get a lot of positive feedback from parents. Um, the students will always tell me, I mean, I mean, I always tell the students, you're never getting rid of me, you'll always see me in Target, okay? <laughs> and I'll be in Target and sometimes my own children are like, why did I come in here with you? We're talking to 100 parents, but parents will always come up to me and they do positive, like a lot of the things, a lot of the positive comments I get is how their students feel empowered after, um, you know, they get this dose of science in sixth grade where we really focus on student impact and not just in my class sixth grade across the board um, at Hammershold and all of this starts also with the elementary teachers kind of building up to this moment and then beyond but you know just speaking from my experience in sixth grade the students do feel empowered and the parents appreciate the sense of empowerment that there's that their children have been given so Eliza King you're one of those students tell us about how you got involved with this issue say it started back in kindergarten at Frost School when our teacher informed us about the issue of plastics so I noticed I started to notice more about like the plastics on the side of the road and it really bothered me about the like that it was there and it shouldn't be there in the first place so I decided on Earth Day which would be a good day I decided to walk down the road and pick up some of the plastics that I found Great. And what do you want your classmates and parents to do? I would want them to like reduce or eliminate the use of the single-use bottles or any other single-use plastic product. It's ending up in our oceans and like Ms. Novak said, the kids in the oceanography unit, they're like, oh I love whales, dolphins, the beach. Well, they're ruining all that. And how's that going at your house? I feel like we use plastics in a good way like we don't really use a single use we use reusable plastics that can be used more than one time great so nancy pinkham right down on the other end here tell us a little bit about what middlesex county is doing well i serve as the county clerk now but i was the i, I originally was a councilwoman in east brunswick in 2005 to 2013 and liddy i just want to give a shout out to liddy raise your hand liddy because liddy was the one who really got me into all these environmental things so one one of the things she started was the community garden she was always busy talking about some kind of environmental thing and Liddy by the way is uh, also works at Rutgers we're so lucky that we have so many people from Rutgers here it's such a huge asset and we really underappreciate it but when I was the person in the assembly I was not the chair of the assembly I don't think Speaker Coughlin would be happy to hear that but I was chair of the environmental committee and I was lucky that Senator Smith was the chair on the Senate side and, and he's also from Middlesex County so we had the most progressive agenda in a decade so I served in the assembly after being on council for not for um, seven years I was nine years on council but also when I was on council we also started we said well we you know we have so much garbage collection is costing us a lot of money we have to save money so we're like okay we're going to change the garbage from twice a week to once a week that's going to save us like six hundred thousand dollars but we said okay you know what we have to create a drop-off location. If we create a drop-off location, then people won't be so upset about cutting the garbage collection down because it's also gonna cut down the carbon pollution from the trucks and the wear and tear on the roads. And people said to me, no one from East Brunswick is ever gonna go and drop off anything at a center. Forget that, they're not leaving their house. But it is one of the most successful recycling centers in all of the areas nobody has one like that and you know we had to get the DEP to approve it but we were able to do that and right now we recycle so many things there so we said you know okay we're going to do this Senator Smith had this idea we're going to do the plastic bag ban and this is the strongest bag strongest ban of plastics in the country it's not just the plastic bags but it's it's polystyrene styrofoam it's also the plastic straws and a few other products so it was really it took a couple of years actually to get this um ban passed when you really think of you know people are so mad they're going into the store they're coming out like brad's friend saying you know they got to carry all their stuff right the whole point is so simple it's just to reduce the use right centuries 
people didn't have plastic bags. They were just using their cloth bags or their hats or whatever they're using, things in the environment to be able to do this. So we're just trying to reduce our waste. We're trying, your garbage can would make Brad really happy if the mayor really happy if he just didn't have anything in it and we wouldn't have so many problems and the same for the recycling can it should be lower and lower and lower every week I myself personally don't have that much garbage you know you can do a self audit right you can say what are you doing to save energy do your own little energy audit at home and say like how am I saving energy on the lights how can I hang my clothes on the line people think that's crazy but it's free why would you not do that you know some people say to me why do you hang your clothes on the line like why not it's free why would I not and uh, you know even the straws you know people get so upset about the straws people drank out of cups for years without a straw then somebody came up with this idea I could make money by selling a straw well you can drink perfectly fine without a straw I mean there are some people that are differently abled and a straw might be helpful for them but in general it's a wasteful product that we don't need the same you know the plastic bags were flying all over the town all over the state they're getting in the water and just to put it in context a little bit so since 1950 the global annual production of plastic has increased two million tons to 381 million tons so one-third of the plastic products are single-use products and it was estimated that a hundred billion single-use carry-out bags a hundred billion and 25 billion polystyrene plastic coffee cups, 390 million straws, that's an amazing number, right? A day are thrown away in the US. Four billion plastic bags are used and disposed of in New Jersey each year. Now, when we started the recycling, you know, years ago, people would you know they were being sold overseas polystyrene was being sold overseas it's a very interesting chemical product that can expand and contract and we would contract it and ship it overseas they would expand it and use it for other things and they finally said we're not we're not going to take it anymore we tried very hard in new jersey to get companies to set up polystyrene recycling but the problem was because of the tomato sauce the oil other products on the polystyrene it just wasn't really possible and one of the big things about straws that a lot of people don't realize also is that the straws jam up all of the recycling machines so it's not just a matter of having straw that you don't need it's jamming everything up and then you can't do the recycling so tetra TerraCycle, which somebody mentioned before is a trenton company super good doing amazing stuff on recycling there's just so much more we can do and you can take your own steps you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you that you need a plastic bag you need a, a, a stronger bag here's the East Brunswick bag that they're having out at the recycling center but the point is just to not have that um, very filmy bag that's just becoming a pollutant and breaking down further in the water and some places are taking those bags and they're melting them down they're burning them as somebody was saying which is polluting the air that much more but they're using it to create oil and there have been companies that looked at ways to turn the products back to oil so there's lots of research happening every day Rutgers is doing a really amazing job on it I can talk about the um, you know the other issues the implementation as we get uh, around but I did do a class in the school and I went to the high school and said to the students like what's your big issue and they brought up the issue of the water bottles but when you talk about advocacy you never know what's going to be the source of an issue what's going to be the sticking point well one of the things that became obvious not to offend anybody on the schools but like the companies that were serving the food lunch make money by selling water bottles to the students and they did not want to give it up in their contract that source of um, income and so sometimes it's not always just about the water or just about the filling station it's something about where does the source of money come from so now the one other thing I want to mention is that during COVID there was as we said a restriction on the water so right now people can't use those um, uh, the the filling stations but we have to also look at the contracts so that we're not incurring also an expense a further expense for our residents at the same time we're incurring we're 
having people use more of the plastic disposable bottles. So what, another source of plastic is also in the clothes. We have a lot of poly um, products and clothes, and clothes are becoming disposable items. They're used like seven times on average, and then people are throwing them away. So there's lots of ways that we can, um, we can address these things. One thing I want to mention is anybody that has these type of bags that come from Fresh Direct or anything like that, we have the food uh, replenishing um, facility in Middlesex County to provide food for residents, but if you can take those bags and recycle them, they're using them because they also don't have plastic bags, but they could take the sturdier bags and help to be able to serve the public that are food challenged right now, so that would be helpful. So, Can you give us some strategies for right influencing now. our policymakers? I'm sorry, what? Can you give us a few strategies for influencing other policymakers? I can, actually. I did bring some samples of letters, and I have, which I can hand out, even though I shouldn't have handouts, but um, <laughs> 10 tips for advocates, so I'll pass that out. I did advocacy for many years before I went into the uh, legislature, and sample letters for calling your legislator so that you, when you write a letter to the legislators, or to your mayor or your council. You want to get to the point as quickly as possible because they're not going to read a very lengthy letter. You want to start with the title and make it as bold as you can. What's the issue that you're going to call about? What are three things? Always, always pick the rule of three. Three things that you want them to do. You want to spell it out for them and that will help get their attention and be much more effective. Always work in leveraging your numbers and work with advocacy groups. I think somebody had up the slide with the Sierra Club or different groups, the East Brunswick Environmental Commission. It could be the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts and, you know, their strength in numbers. So get people together, you know, and, and state your case. And, you know, no legislator, no mayor is psychic. If you don't say what's bothering you, how will they know it? People will say, yeah, I'm so mad about the potholes, but did you call up and say that there's a pothole on your street? If you didn't call up, how would they know that? They can't go to every single street. So express yourself, work with the experts. And as I said, we have so many resources in our area from Rutgers, the students and the professors that are so incredibly knowledgeable about so many different issues. We're, we're just really, really fortunate to have that. Um, and find out, you know, find a legislator who's in charge of a committee that's going to make a difference. And we have, by the way, Congressman Pallone, who's like one of the most amazing workhorses in the country, and he's involved on the environmental committee. He's been a champion of environmental issues for so many years, and you can always go to him. He's been involved in offshore drilling. I worked with him on a uh, the wind turbines, you know, any issue, and he also does a lot of health issues. So there's a lot of crossover between health issues like the plastic in your body and um, environmental issues, and he covers both of them. So he's a great, a great asset for, for New Jersey and for the country. So, and you know, never say never. Every little step makes a difference. Any little thing you could do, whether you do it by yourself or you get somebody to do with you as a group and advocate for change. Change is always possible. So now it's up to you to ask questions. So if you haven't already, uh, fill out your cards, pass them to the aisle, and we will get some of those questions um, in the hopper um, while we're waiting for our questions, and they're coming uh, online as well. Does anybody on the panel want to ask anybody else on the panel a question? Well, I just can I just add one more thing? You sure. know, the um, department, the uh, DEP has great um, information, and there's a lot of information across the state at different locations for how to use, um, how to how to deal with the po with the plastic bans, but also how to find manu manufacturers that can sell products that are usable. If you, are, how many people here have a business? Does anybody here have a business? Okay, so they do have um, resources for businesses as well, where to buy products that are environmental, and there's lots of that available. 
So I'm going to ask some questions and just raise your hand if you want to be the answerer, okay? And I'll try to make sure I get all the hands. So why are we using re reusable made of plastic and not burlap or cloth? Reusable plastic, are you talking about the bags? It was about the bags, yeah. They yes. can use, people can use any, oh, by the way, I want to say one thing about the plastic bag ban. The, um, the food stores themselves what, there's also a ban on paper bags in the food store. The food stores did not want to sell paper bags. They said, if we can't use those crummy little cheap plastic bags, we don't want to use anything. We want to force the residents to bring a bag. So they said, we don't want to be responsible for having any more bags. We don't want to pay. We're not, we're not going to charge you. We're not going to do anything. We just want you to learn to bring your own. So, you know, they were the ones who specified the handle that it had to be, st how can you tell what kind of bag, there's 10,000 different layers of plastic bags, which one's gonna be effective, which one's gonna be acceptable. So the way it's acceptable is if it has a stitched handle, then they can have that bag. So some of them are coated, you see a lot of different, different ones out there right now, but that is the reason. But the reason, you can have any kind of bag you wanna bring from home. And the ring your purse if you want. Yeah, the reason they're plastic is uh, the plastic bags that are now available for purchase are kind of end use plastics that have been, they're not recyclable anymore. And so they use them to, to make the bags. Hmm. So we have several for our mayor. <laughs> Why is East Brunswick, East Brunswick only recycling plastic number one and two? I think that's pretty obvious. The market and the recycling uh, centers will only accept one and two. So that's what we recycle. The others need to be, um, are much more difficult and there's limited places that will take those. So we do what we can and recycle the most common plastics, which are one and two, and that's what our recycling centers will accept. So any strategies anybody else can think of to get beyond one and two? Um, I think part of the issue is also what um, Dr. Schlushel said is these other plastics are low quality plastics that can't necessarily be recycled. They're end use plastics as she would call them. Mm -hmm. There is a movement now to really go to more go back to glass products not to use those plastic containers for food to go back to the old Pyrex to go back to um, the, uh, if you want to call it Aladdin, thermoses that are metal and made of other things rather than plastic. So we really should be trying to get away from all plastics if we can and, you know, get into, we, we have another thing that Liddy came up with actually was free cycle and that is where we're trying to reduce things going into the garbage, whether it's plastic or otherwise, by finding another use for it, giving it to somebody else, swapping the free cycle. How many people know what free cycle is? Oh, wow, Liddy, you should get a star for that. <laughs> and it's really a huge success, and it takes things out of the landfill. So whether it's not going in recycling or not going into the landfill, it's all good of us to reduce our use of products. And just as a, an aside, the, the landfill, which is housed here in East Brunswick, but it serves the entire county, uh, East Brunswick actually gets a, um, a credit, a money paid to the town community host benefit for the use of the landfill in East Brunswick. It's approximately $4 million a year that, that of revenue that comes to East Brunswick. And the landfill itself, I think presently is at about at 180 feet. The goal would be to not get past 240. So uh, the, our op options here is, well, we could just, nobody likes the landfill, so let's get to 240 and cap it. Um, but that's really not what we want to do if we're talking about being serious about reuse, repurposing, recycling, or refusing. Uh, we want to try to keep that landfill as long as possible. And then it's not just the money to the township, but it means that we're doing everything that we said is important for the environment by not making um, that landfill uh, reach the, the, the height at which we would be forced to cap it. 
You know, the landfill years ago, they said it was going to close a long time ago, and the county and the municipalities worked very hard to retool the landfills to make them as efficient as possible and extend their life and to also capture the gases that are created in the landfill and recycle those as well. So there's many things that we've done with the landfill to make it more efficient and make it more um, acceptable and revenue producing rather than uh, revenue uh, re costing us more money. So it's been a success story. So here's a question for Yvette. Why are we only talking about water bottles and not soda and sport drinks? <laughs> well, as I said, um, we wanted to choose something that's simple, something that we all use from time to time. And we have to, you know, take baby steps in this. Obviously, we, we would like to, the biggest polluters are really soda bottles. You know, uh, Coca-Cola is still the biggest plastic polluter, although now they have these new bottles that they claim are, you know, 100% recyclable. But we have to start small and, you know, maybe you haven't given up soda, but I have. And, um, you know, although I do still use, you know, occasionally a plastic water bottle. So this is something that I think is accessible to everyone. Um, and we can really make a difference. As I said, I don't know if I mentioned the slide, everyone uses, it's calculated, 165 water bottles per year. So if each person in the room eliminates their plastic water bottles and uses recycled, you know, uh, reusable bottles, that's 165 times however many people we have and others at home. So that's, that's making a difference. We have to start small is really the only reason why we're not talking about the uh, soda bottles. You're seeing a change in packaging already. There's a lot of manufacturers that are really reducing packages, like uh, Cascade dish detergent. Now, instead of coming in a plastic container, it comes in the little pouches and in a, in a, in a pouch. You're seeing dirt uh, laundry detergent coming not in the big containers but in smaller things. I think Catherine had in her letter writing that you can write to the companies and say please reduce your use of packaging. So there's lots of different ways we can make an impact. I think it's kind of human nature if you study uh, the attempts to try to change human behavior. Uh, it takes all the effort to get the first couple of steps going uh, but then once it starts, there's an inertia that takes over. So if we start with the single-use plastic bags and then we move to the water bottles, I think what tends to happen is then it easily gets, the lesson gets learned and it spills over to everything. So you get a couple of wins and then the rest of them are a lot easier. So it starts small and it will start to pick up exactly. momentum. Okay, let's talk about our schools again. What can, what, what about plastic utensils and use of alternatives in schools? Well, I don't eat the school lunch. Eliza, do you eat the school lunch? Uh, well, <coughs> some of the lunches, they don't require like utensils. Like there are some of them where you like you can use your fingers, but a few of like they've tried to reduce it a little bit, but it's not really doing anything. Like the kids are still like using the utensils. Do you think if they were less accessible that the students wouldn't take them? Like if today was pizza day and we just didn't have an option to take forks and knives that they just would figure it out? I mean, is that an option? Just you know, like when you're setting a table, you set a table for what you need to eat the meal, right? So maybe if we just stop, you think that would work? I think it would work because it would give them, it would urge them to go towards the meals that don't really need the utensils more. Okay. A lot of the products now in the schools and the colleges are compostable. They've tried to move away from trays to more cardboard and paper trays. And in the DEP website, there are... Um, 
places to buy those products. So that's a way they're oh, helping right. people to source them. Yeah, but the utensils are still not the compostable. No, some of the utensils of actually are. are available that are kind no, right, of. Not not, right, I'm, yeah, I'm talking specifically about East Brunswick Public Schools. Right. We should have a chat then with the school board. Yeah. Next time we're going to get the school board <laughs> into the room too. Okay, Nicole, we have a question for you. The question is, um, not only things flush down the toilet, but also the water from our washing machines. What do we do about that? <laughs> yeah, the, the microfibers made a lot of um, made a lot of news. <laughs> Um, I, my understanding is that washing machines used to have filters, traps on the end that collected some of those fibers that they don't anymore. Um, they're, depending on what type of water, folks generally in, uh, in wastewater or sewer overflows will find a lot of fibers. I'll say that we don't always look for them in our samples. It's, it's like even more tedious than doing the particles and I have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and, and I, I honestly don't know what to, to say about them. Um, there have been some, I'm aware of some companies that have worked on trying to design their products so that they don't shed as much. Um, and Sometimes uh, I think they're adding plastic though to do that. Yeah, I'm also aware that there were, there were some groups that were looking into things that you could add to your wash to help collect the fibers. I would just like to see folks that are working on these things to have controls, and I wasn't sure all of those studies had controls. I don't, I don't have any good advice, but yes, there's definitely shedding. And one of the reasons as well that we don't always look for them in the water beyond it being tedious is that it's really easy to contaminate the water samples that we look for with fibers because, I mean, when it's not in the water, normally we just call it dust. Like your, your clothes are constantly shedding it, so we would have to be very careful about what we wore when we sampled which makes me personally think that it might be more of a air transport issue than water, which is not to say that it's unimportant. I'm just a water person. <laughs> so I'm sorry, those are <laughs> vomiting the things I could say about that, which is not much help for practical things. Okay, so I know several of you have asked additional questions. We're gonna take one last question because we wanna make sure we have time for our raffle and um, our winners. Of so, Here's one for whoever wants. Several states have passed laws called extended producer responsibility. Has there been any discussion of this in New Jersey? Do any of us know anything about this topic? Like companies being responsible for like the end life of their, is that well, what you're asking? In, at Rutgers, I would say they, they have had a number of conferences on this issue. And people nationally, could, uh, cons the um, businesses themselves nationally are looking at this issue and working together on it. So it's a, it, there are many, many people working on these things in many different ways. So it turns out we have a school board member here who mm -hmm. can join us maybe and uh, respond to a few items that didn't get covered. Person's name Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Welcome. We're delighted you came. Can you can you come near a mic? Well, while Barbara's coming up, I'll just say one thing about the stormwater. You talked a little bit about the stormwater. So New Jersey is a very old state, obviously, and our stormwater drains are very old and so now the state has been doing a lot of work about the runoff whenever there's heavy rains that this the drains cannot handle the water so it runs off into our waterways and is causing a lot of pollution it's but something that the state has been addressing and um, that's another really important issue and one of the questions for the mayor is why aren't we covering um, the the drains so the plastic doesn't go down the drains when the stormwater flows. 
then we wouldn't be able to trap the stormwater and we'd have floods. So I think the, the goal is to try to get rid of the plastic and to keep our stormwater drains open so that we can accomplish both. And people could pick up their litter and they wouldn't end up in the storm drain. But some of them do in certain places have floatables control, which would be large, larger netting, which also requires maintenance there, but that would only be capturing large particles. Um, I think the Ranton River by Rutgers actually has that in one location. Yeah, it's it's pretty variable the, what type the, of treatment The DEP there is. recently changed its requirements for the actual stormwater drains and the um, the the, um, the size of the slots that water can go through, so that it would prevent a lot of the plastic bags from entering this, the the stream. But there are particular parts of town that tend to flood, and unfortunately, what ended up happening was that it then didn't collect the stormwater and we had flooding problems, which is a different problem that the DEP is trying to address with these stormwater rules. So it's not uncommon to try to solve one problem and then actually end up creating creating another. And the, before I let Barbara talk, because I really do want everyone to hear from her, uh, I think that it is important that each of us recognize that we are the masters of our future and we do need to advocate for the things that we feel need to be done uh, and when you write letters I think it's a wonderful thing to write to companies and to write to legislatures and to write to people who have the capacity to make change uh, and I think it's great that we do these letter writing campaigns but I have to tell you when I get the 10th letter that says the same thing that 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 over and over again legislators do tend to sort of not take them as seriously because it's very simple to just sign your name to something. But if you actually take the letter and take from it those things that you think are most important and actually write it yourself or work on researching this topic and becoming knowledgeable about it and make an appointment with your legislators, whether it's Congress or your mayor or, or assembly people and legislators in the state, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but that is going to go far more uh, than, than signing a letter that you haven't even really read or understand. Uh, and I think those, those are the type of things that really move the bar um, a lot further. And it's all in your hands. You can do this. So hopefully all those extra letters do end up in recycling. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's encouraging. Okay, Barbara. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Pinkin, thank you for uh, having me here. I just wanted to answer a couple of the questions that I heard uh, during the time, and thank you for appointing me to this committee. It it, the committee did an amazing job, really you did, in, in a short period of time. Uh, the district is committed to taking steps uh, to make sure these are steps that are sustainable. We do have 22 refilling stations in the district. And again, yes, Hammerschild has one, definitely could use more. Um, Church has three, the high school has five. So we are heading in the right direction. Uh, like you had mentioned, thank, uh, thank you for mentioning that with COVID, uh, we did have uh, you know, a little bit of a time where we were more focused on the COVID safety of things. Uh, that was our main priority, of obviously, for the last two years. So to make sure that the schools are open, the schools are safe, food is safe, uh, water is safe. And the other issue with water quality, also with the refillable stations, is that you know we have aging buildings, and some of the buildings, we have to constantly check the water quality on those refilling stations. So that was the refilling stations topic. And then um, the trays uh, are fully compostable. In fact, this, this fall, we're gonna be using a fiber blend uh, compostable, am I saying it right? Compostable, compostable? Yeah. <laughs> I never say it right. That's so Chase. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Is there, do we have a way to go? Absolutely. I mean, every little step counts. Uh, I, you know, I, I thank you for your efforts. The students do a lot of amazing things and I'm, I was a frost mom, so go frost. Um, but, uh, you know, our students, uh, as you saw from the and our teachers are really committed to all important issues like this. And so I just, I was sitting there in the back and I wasn't gonna say anything, but I felt like, you know, let me just at least tell you where we're at. And 
And Dr. Valeski definitely, uh, you sorry couldn't make it, but he definitely supports all these efforts. I think we want to thank all our students for coming tonight too, right? I, I did. I said though I thank. I'm talking them. about even in the audience. Oh, we have. So we have, raise your hand if you're a student and he's sponsoring. Oh wow, that's a lot. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to add that we have 123 people between yeah, online amazing. and in this that's room, amazing. which I think is a great step. And thank you all for coming and being part of this. And now we're going to turn the program back to Chris. Well, now we come to a very happy time in the program where we will honor the Hammerschild students the student winners of the poster contest. I'm going to call them up, and I would like the audience to please hold your applause until they all are here. Third place winner, Maha Tanvir, who will receive a gift certificate for Magnifico's ice cream. <laughs> Second place winner, Maisha Khan, <laughs> hold on, Maisha Khan, who will receive a high-end uh, a water uh, container from Dick's Sporting Goods, and first place winner, Zoe Kwan, who will receive passes to Crystal Springs Water Park given by the East Brunswick Parks and Recreation and Community. So now let's call them up and give them a big <laughs> The students are receiving <laughs> a beautiful certificate prepared by Frankie Bush and Ronnie Lee. Make sure that she is the cheering section. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're very sorry that the other students couldn't be here, but you know the kind of awards they're going to get, and you can see the beautiful work on the whiteboard that they accomplish. So thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. And now, I want to give the acknowledgments. Because we're about to go into one of the most important parts of the evening, and that is the call to action. Before we get to that, let me acknowledge all the people who have been such an enormous help to us. First, Melissa Hozak who has done an exceptional job. <laughs> Melissa has done an exceptional job with the marketing of this event as well as the technology. The second people I want to thank is EBTV, who right now are recording this for you and it can be used again and again. So how about a hand for EBTV? So the following organizations, East Brunswick Hadassah, East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force, ADK Kappa Chapter. Give us all a hand. <laughs> we also want to thank the East Brunswick Parks, Recreation, and Community for their gifts, Dick's Sporting Goods for their generosity, Magnifico's Ice Cream, and do not throw it away. So thank you so, uh, very much, guys. Uh, really appreciate your generosity and your involvement. And now, before I send you to the call to action, this involves the letter writing that you've had time to take a look at that was on your seat. Um, the postcard, you'll find Catherine, our environmental expert, has postcards. The postcard is to Governor Murphy, and he is asking Governor Murphy to move the ball forward. We've done a great job getting the ban on plastic bags. Our next step is to get past plastic one bottle at a time. You will have an opportunity to take that postcard 
And just as Mayor Cohen said, write a few lines of your own and sign it. That will be effective. We also have the Captain's Challenge. And what that is, we are asking for five volunteers tonight. People who will come up and be a captain and gather five friends or family to sit at the table and write a letter. In the packets that have been prepared, Catherine has given you a sample letter, a guided letter, and a list of the all important contacts that really will make a difference to move this ball forward. So we would like you to go back now and I want to thank our Zoom audience for tuning in tonight. I thank you so much for your attention, for your involvement. I also want to thank uh, Liddy Hamarati who has put on the QR and the QR in your packet, remember, this is, going, this is going to take you like magic right into the sustainability task force. So please don't leave home without it. And please, never doubt that a small group of concerned, thoughtful citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Thank you and good night.